All right, we are going to continue on with differentials. So at the end of class, uh, or at the end of the lecture last time, we, we were talking about um, uh, what we had to define the cotangent bundle and uh, the canonical bundle. And uh, today we're going to compute some examples of, uh, of cotangent bundles and canonical bundles. So the, the maybe the most important and most famous example uh, is, is going to be this proposition and this is called the Euler sequence. Of course, uh, it seems like half the things in math were named after Euler, and this is another one of them. All right, so I, let me get, tell you the sequence, and then we'll see what all these things mean. So this is going to compute the cotangent sheaf of projective space uh, by giving it in, in an exact sequence of things we already uh, understand. So you can take a OPN of minus 1, and you're going to take uh, n plus 1 copies of it. And then uh, the co-kernel will just be the structure sheaf. All right, so this is an exact sequence of sheaves. And uh, let me just clarify, this notation here means you take OPN of minus 1, and you take the direct sum of n plus 1 copies. So right here, this is n plus 1. Um, sometimes people also write this as uh, OPN minus 1, and they'll put a little uh, sum symbol in the exponent. Uh, this is to clarify uh, that it's not like the N plus 1 copies of the tensor product here. Um, in this case, we're doing the sum. Okay, um, well, let's see. Is there anything else I need to say about this? Um, yeah, so, so I guess the statement of the proposition is uh, there is an exact sequence. All right, and so from this from this exact sequence, we can deduce uh, properties of the cotangent uh, bundle of projective space. All right, let's do the proof of this one. Uh, first, let's label this ma these maps. We'll call this one F and this one G. And uh, before we get into the details, let's just uh, get the idea. This is sort of the idea of the definition of F. All right, so if you um, if you try to take the differential of, of a regular function on, on an open set of projective space, uh, a particular one xi over xj, well, um, you might be tempted to try and apply the quotient rule to, to this computation. You'd get 1 over uh, xj uh, dxi uh, minus uh, xi over xj squared dxj. All right, so that's just sort of uh, applying the, uh, the quotient rule. Uh, you get something like this. Okay, now this doesn't uh, quite make sense because uh, xi itself is not a regular, xi is not a regular function, xj is not a regular function, right? They're sections of some uh, line bundle, but they're not actually regular functions. So, so this doesn't quite make sense, but this is going to be the idea of the definition of f. So we're going to think of uh, this right here, these n plus 1 things as corresponding to uh, dx0, uh, so this is corresponding to uh, dx0, dx1, uh, up to dxn. All right, so um, all right, so that's going to motivate uh, this definition of the map f. So f is the map from uh, the cotangent bundle into n plus 1 copies of OPN plus 1. All right, so we're going to take uh, dxi uh, over xj. All right, this is this is something uh, in this uh, sheaf of differentials, right? Um, at least uh, on some open set, and uh, you're going to, we're going to map it to. We'll just uh, take a zeros here, and then we'll put one over x j in component i. So this is the i spot, and then we'll put a minus x i over x j squared. Here in the jth spot. All right, and zero is the end. All right, so that that this is uh, motivated by by this rule here. Uh, we'll take this map. All right, let's see. That, does that, does this sort of make sense? So um, x i over x j is a regular function on on, on standard open set U j, right? And uh, if you take the d of that, you'll get a section of um, 
uh, the cotangent bundle on uh, UIJ, and um, and then uh, you can map it somewhere here. These these things here are definitely uh, sections of uh, OPN minus one on UJ. All right, so this so this, uh, this makes sense. Okay, now um, we've only defined it for uh, on these on these basic open sets. Uh, and only for uh, uh, certain functions here, but in fact, um, in fact, uh, this is good enough. This will define a whole map. Uh, why is that? Well, so so on on U J. So remember, uh, we have that. Um, okay. Well, let me let me say it like this. Uh, U J. You can think of it as being isomorphic to uh, the spectrum of the ring uh, K. Uh, x1, x0, over xj, up to uh, xn over xj. All right, that's one way to think about it. Oh, and of course, you omit the xj over xj from this list. Okay, and, and then we had um, we had a, an example last time where we, we computed that, um, that if you take the cotangent sheaf and you restrict it to uh, an aff affine open uh, subset, for example, uh, uj, then this would just uh, be equal to um, the, the free module generated by, so generated by these symbols, right? So r Oh, where, where R, of course, is just uh, uh, this ring here. Okay, and I guess I want a, a big, that's a big tilde over that. And, uh, and of course, we also have uh, O minus 1 on Pn uh, restricted to, to Uj. Um, well, this can just be thought of as R times uh, 1 over uh, x. Let me change that to Uj. 1 over xj um, here this is this is a free module of rank 1 um, that's just this and um, okay a, a tilde and so uh, so a map from this this thing to this thing just corresponds to a map of, of, of modules okay and that's what we've written down here is a map of modules we said what it does on all the generators and um, and, and so th this defines a map of, of modules so it defines a map of the sheaves uh, on UJ and uh, then um, and then we can glue them together. Okay, so I guess the one thing we should check is to make sure that they uh, agree on the overlaps. So the, so the sort of thing the thing you have to check right is that uh, on on UK uh, intersect UJ you need to check that the, uh, D uh, X I over X K. Uh, so if you apply F to that. You want that to be the same as f of uh, if, if you wrote it in the other basis in the the, the UK basis, right? Which uh, would be like this. All right. Uh, so, so that's sort of the question. All right. So I'm going to write this down. Uh, this left hand side. When I apply f to it, I just get one over at x k times d x i. Uh, minus uh, x i over x k squared uh, d x k. Where now I'm thinking of this d x i and this uh, d x k as just a basis uh, for for this uh, o p n of minus one. So it's just just the standard basis of this space here. That's what I, how I said I was going to think about it. So that's how I'm going to write it here. So now uh, basically what the map f does is it just says you know, take the differential of this thing, pretending that xi and xj were actually regular functions. All right. Um, so now uh, we can sort of uh, do the same thing on the other side. But before we do that, we should uh, up apply the, the product rule. So we'll get something like um, uh, xj over xk d of xi xj plus um, uh, the other way around xi over xj times d of x j over x k. All right, and now uh, f is supposed to be a, a module homomorphism. 
and um, and so so this this part just uh, commutes right so I'll have uh, xj over xk and then uh, f of d of this uh, will just be um, 1 over xj uh, dxi minus xi over xj squared dxj okay here's the second term and then you check that these actually match I think um, you know this matches with uh, this term and then um, and then maybe these two cancel out and then maybe this matches with this okay so um, so this shows that this uh, this map agrees on the overlaps uh, we checked it on the, on the generators and so and so therefore they glue together to make a map of sheaves uh, F all right All right, so finally now let's define the map G. So remember, uh, G is, is the map from uh, the, uh, M plus 1 copies of O minus 1 uh, to structure sheaf. And uh, the, def the definition here will be pretty simple. You just take uh, uh, these N functions here and uh, map it to uh, this. All right, so uh, so this uh, the same formula formula makes sense on any open set. Remember, these fees are just um, rational functions of the degree minus one that are you know well defined on the, that, that you know have uh, no division by zero on the open set you're looking at, and then if you multiply them all by x uh, zero through x n, then you'll get some degree uh, zero functions that um, that are also uh, well defined. There's no division by zero, and then you can add them together. Uh, so, so that makes perfect sense. All right, so now it's, we just need to do a, a little bit of algebra to make sure that uh, this sequence is exact. All right, so um, we can do that just by checking uh, on the open cover, right? Uh, and without loss of generality, let's just look at uh, U0. All right, and I claim that F is just going to correspond to a matrix that looks like this. It'll be minus X1. Let me write my affine coordinates, so we'll leave the, the zero here. Um, uh, minus x2 over x0 dot 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 up to uh, minus xn over x0. And then um, and then we'll have one, one down the diagonal like this. And, and zeros elsewhere. All right, so why is this the right matrix? I mean, why, why is it in a matrix the right thing here? Well, so remember our, our map here, F, um, if, we're, if we're restricting to an open set UJ, in this case, uh, we're looking at U0, um, then this is just a, a map of free modules, right? And, uh, and U0 is, is freely generated by these, uh, these DXI over X0. Um, and so, so, the, so this, uh, this description here is just gonna give us the, the columns of, uh, of the matrix, right? Um, Okay, and now um, the generators uh, on this side of this thing are just a one over xj, or in our case, one over x zero. Um, all right, so so this so this entry here just uh, corresponds to to a one, and this entry right here corresponds to um, uh, xi over xj uh, negative. All right, and uh, and these uh, these ones are always uh, in the, in the same spot. Or, or, or sorry, sorry, the, the, this J here, right? This J is zero and, and the J doesn't change, but the I does change. All right, so so that's exactly what I think I wrote down in, in this matrix. Um, you, have, uh, you have these things, uh, element zero row, and each column has one of these and, and one, one. All right, so you can uh, think about that. Uh, that's exactly what it is. And then, um, and then of course, uh, G uh, corresponds to the matrix uh, one, uh, x1 over x0, x2 over x0, and so on. We're, we're trying to, uh, you know, write everything in these uh, uh, degree zero coordinates um, on u0. Okay, and now it's just a matter of algebra to check uh, that the, the sequence is exact. 
right? You, you just have a uh, r to the n, r to the n plus 1 to r to 0, where this is given by a g and this is given by f. And, uh, and check that exactly the kernel of G is exactly the image of F. And um, okay, and I think that's a straightforward check. Of course, uh, R here is equal to uh, the ring uh, K uh, x1 over x0 and so on. Okay, so I, I think that's uh, that's the end of the proof. So let's just uh, after all that, let's review the statement, make sure we know what we proved. So we proved that uh, the Euler sequence, that here's an exact sequence that's going to describe for us the cotangent bundle of projective space. Okay. All right, now that we know that the cotangent bundle, you know, we can easily get the tangent bundle just by taking the dual of that sequence. So remember, if you have a sequence of locally free sheaves, exact sequence, and you take the dual, you will again get a, a, a exact sequence of locally free sheaves um, by going in the opposite order. So uh, we'll have this uh, tangent sequence. This is, this is you could still call this the Euler sequence, but now we're we're taking the dual of it, so we get an expression for the tangent bundle like this, and the minus one turns to a one, I believe. Uh, that was an exercise uh, that we had before. All right, so this is uh, the Euler sequence for the tangent bundle. All right, uh, now I want to say something that's mostly just to help your intuition. So if this helps you, great. If it doesn't make sense, uh, don't worry about it too much. I, I want to think about uh, Pn as being the space of, uh, of, uh, of lines in a fixed vector space V. I want to give it a name. V that has dimension uh, n plus 1, right? And then I want to think of this Euler sequence uh, like this. So, so this n plus 1 really should be thought of as being a tensor product with the vector space V. Okay, and it does make sense to um, to, to take a tensor product uh, with uh, a sheaf with the vector space. You just think of this uh, vector space as sort of the constant sheaf, the sections over it. Any open set is just a V, and then you take the tensor product there. Okay, and um, I want to uh, I want to think of, uh, of this thing here as being uh, the space of um, one homogeneous uh, vector fields. Uh, on on V. Okay, where where here I, I'm uh, I'm taking the tangent space at P any so P P is any point of V. The tangent space to P at V is uh, is canonically isomorphic to V itself. So that's a nice uh, feature of vector spaces. And the one homogeneous uh, comes from this. So meaning uh, you know if if you multiply your point in V by some scalar, you'll know exactly um, how the, the vector field changes. Um, uh, that is, uh, if, you have, if you have your vector field X and you look at uh, the point uh, uh, lambda times P, where, so P is an element of the vector space and lambda is a scalar, uh, that will just be uh, lambda times uh, the value of the vector field at P. Um, of course, where I'm using this identification TP of V is isomorphic to V. All right, so so I can think of, of OP01 tensor V as being uh, these one homogeneous vector fields on V. They look like, you know, the sum of, um, let's say, uh, psi i times uh, d d x i, where, where uh, here is psi i are, are going to be, you know, sections of OP1. View and then and then I'm thinking of, of the tangent space at p to v as it's just the span of um, t d x i all right times you know times zero or scalars all right um, so so you can think about them like that now the point here is now you can take one of these uh, vector fields on v 
Uh, if it's one homogeneous, you can view it as actually a vector field on the projective space. So remember, uh, uh, right now I'm thinking about a vector field as something you know that, that eats uh, functions and gives you, uh, uh, you know, at a point eats a function, gives you a number. It's like taking the directional derivative. So uh, if, if you've taken like a class in smooth manifolds, that makes sense to you. All right, so um, let, let's now try and apply, let's try and apply uh, x uh, lambda p to f. Now the, the functions on a, on projective space are just um, a zero homogeneous function. So now let's think of this as being a zero homogeneous function. Uh, so in other words, it's a function a well-defined function on, on the projective space, right? Well, uh, this will be something like a sum of psi i a d d x i uh, of f, right? And, uh, and then uh, we're going to, after we do that, we're going to evaluate at the point um, uh, uh, lambda p, right? So then, uh, x equals lambda b. All right, but um, the point is, uh, after you take these these partial derivatives and then uh, multiply by a degree one function, uh, what will you get? You'll get something what's once again of, of degree zero, uh, homogeneous degree zero. So this is so this whole thing together will be uh, uh, homogeneous degree zero or zero homogeneous. Um, so this will be exactly the same as a uh, as if you took um, x equal to p. Um, so in other words, this is x p of f. All right, uh, so, so the point is uh, this uh, gives a well-defined um, uh, vector field on on Pn. Okay, and in fact, uh, maybe I won't say too much about it, but in fact, that gives all the vector fields on Pn. In other words, I'm saying uh, this map here is surjective. All right, uh, now we have to think about the kernel. Uh, so, so what is what is the kernel? Well, the kernel. The kernel is given by uh, radial vector fields. So let me try and draw a picture. So here's my vector space of V. And uh, what if we had a vector field that was just uh, sort of always proportional to the point that you're at? So it was, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, something like this. The, the point is that um, uh, if you now think of, of you know, this in projective space, then this vector field is basically zero because it's just uh, the, the arrows are always moving along the line, but this whole line is collapsed to a single point in the projective space. So, so this, this is a radial vector field on a V uh, turns into the zero vector field uh, on, on the projective space. All right, and, and that's exactly uh, the kernel of this map here. Um, so trying to write that down uh, in, in symbols. So we have we have the Euler something called the Euler vector field. Um, which is is given by this uh, one homogeneous vector field. So sum over i of uh, xi d dxi. In other words, uh, the the val um, this vector field, um, the vector at any point of v is just the same point of v itself, right? So x uh, x p is just equal to p. Okay. Okay. So 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 think about that. Okay. And, and all the radial radial vector fields are just the Euler vector field times uh times a zero homogeneous function. Euler uh, vector field times a zero homogeneous. All right, and so that is exactly um, 
this map here. So this takes a, a regular function, or, or in other words, a zero homogeneous function, and, and, then this, and then this here is multiplication by the Euler vector field. Okay, and that will exactly be the kernel of this map. Okay, so um, uh, if that helps you, uh, great. But yeah, that, that's more um, the manifolds version of the Euler sequence. Um, okay, and, and you can think about how, how what I said here is, is closely related to uh, the, the algebraic proof that I gave you too. Okay, so uh, enough of that. Uh, the next uh, very important observation is we, we see that the, the co-normal exact sequence uh, allows us to com compute the canonical line bundle of projective space. So uh, so let, let, let me just uh, recall for you that um, the, um, the canonical line bundle of a space is just equal uh, to the top wedge power of the uh, co-normal sheaf. So this, this here is, is equal to the dimension of x. All right. So uh, let's, let's, let's look at our Euler sequence. So remember our Euler sequence was uh, uh, 0 into uh, the, the co-normal sheaf, and then, uh, and then this, and then this. Okay, and I think I, I wrote down, uh, didn't get the proof, but there was a, a formula. If you want to take the, the top wedge powers uh, of an exact sequence, they are related like this, like this, right? So uh, top wedge power of O minus 1 to N plus 1 will be isomorphic to um, top wedge power of this side, a tensor with uh, the top wedge power of this thing. All right, so that's a formula that we wrote down before. Um, okay, and, and um, we're, we're almost there now. Uh, this thing here is exactly uh, the canonical line bundle of projective space. Uh, the wedge 1 uh, does nothing, right? And this is just the structure sheaf O. And remember, these tensor products are tensor products over O, so that actually does nothing either. And we come up with the, the canonical bundle is just uh, wedge n plus 1 of uh, O minus 1 to the n plus 1. All right now, um, one thing uh, that is that is true is that uh, this is isomorphic to uh, O of uh, minus n minus one. All right, so I, I, I'm not sure if we um, uh, have a theorem to cite uh, for that, but, but maybe the way I would think about this is uh, when you take the top wedge power of uh, of a uh, well, when you take the top wedge power, that corresponds to sort of taking the determinant, right? Because because uh, the square of the rank is equal to the wedges that you're taking, and um, and here you think of O minus one as like a you know minus one homogeneous functions, and if you have a matrix of those and you take the determinant, you know it's, it's an n plus one by n plus one matrix, and if you take the determinant, then you'll get a minus n minus one um, uh, homogeneous function. All right, so you can think about that a little more if you want, but but this is this is a key result and a very important thing to remember. Okay, next uh, we, let's try and let's talk about how we can compute uh, the cotangent bundle and the uh, um, canonical bundle of, of hypersurfaces in projective space. So um, here's a proposition: uh, let X be a hypersurface. Of degree D uh, in Pn, and uh, let's see. And uh, we're going to want uh, the field for this proposition. We feel the field to have characteristic zero. Okay. Then the cotangent sheaf uh, has an exact sequence. Then uh, there is an exact sequence. Like this, O x of minus d. You pull back the um, cotangent sheaf from the um, from the projective space, and uh, and then it maps onto 
uh, the cotangent sheaf of x. So I mean, the sort of the way way to think about this is you know you have a you know cotangent uh, vectors on Pn and a cotangent vector field on Pn, and you can restrict it to x just by looking at only the points in x. And this uh, sequence is saying uh, telling you exactly what what the kernel is of that map. And it's just the ox of, of minus d. Okay, and of course uh, i here is the inclusion of x into the projective space. Okay, I'm not going to give you the whole proof, but let me just uh, describe for you the maps that are in this sequence. So the first map is, is you take a uh, phi, uh, which is a uh, you know a minus uh, a function of degree minus d, and then we'll map it to d of f times phi. All right, uh, so uh, this makes sense, right? Because f is degree d, so if you multiply it by phi, you get something of degree zero. In other words, a regular function, and then you can take a d of that, and um, and uh, and you'll get the sum differential. Okay, sorry, and I should be saying that uh, uh, x is is the vanishing locus of. Of f. So f is the defining equation, uh, degree d. Okay, now uh, you might be worried about whether this is well defined um, because, you know, uh, phi plus uh, f represents the same function on x, right? Because uh, f vanishes. But, uh, but this, of course, would just map to uh, d of uh, f phi plus uh, f squared, which would be d of f phi plus uh, 2f at df. Okay, and uh, once you've pulled back to x, uh, then f is zero, so this, this becomes zero, and so you ended up getting the same answer. All right, so that, that, that's, uh, that's the first map here. And uh, the second map, if we have uh, something like that before, d phi uh, uh, right here, uh, then we can just take it to uh, d of phi restricted to x. All right, so this is basically uh, just the restriction map. Um, okay, so and uh, let's just think, make sure that the composition of these these two maps are, are zero. So if I start with v and I mapped it to d uh, f v, and then I mapped it to d f v restricted to x. Well, if you take f times v restricted to x, f is zero on x. So, um, so that's just uh, so that's just zero. That's what you want. Okay, and then, and then the claim of uh, the proposition, which uh, maybe we won't finish the proof, is that uh, that's exactly uh, the, the kernel there. Um, okay. So uh, let, let's let's leave it at that. All right. And so now um, we can uh, we can actually uh, dualize that to get the. Um, the norm, what's called the normal exact sequence. So uh, we dualize that, and we we'll get that the tangent bundle of x uh, maps into the tangent bundle of the projective space, and then we have uh, O x d here, and this here is called the the normal bundle. All right, so so geometrically. Well, what you're supposed to be thinking about here is the, the the TPN is the tangent bundle of the ambient space. So you know I, I have my my space here, and I have uh, my uh, x inside of inside of there. So the, the square is PN, and this line here is x. And then you have um, you have tangent vectors along x. So these are these blue this blue arrows here is in the tangent space of x. And then uh, but then there's uh, there's the, the whole tangent space of Pn, which maybe has uh, this blue arrow and this uh, green arrow. Uh, and if you um, if you quotient out, um, so, so, so if you start with the whole tangent space and you quotient out the blue stuff, then you're left with the green stuff. And uh, and that's called the normal bundle. They're sort of the directions that point off of the sub-variety and out into the ambient variety. This may be what you think like to think about. And you can kind of think of, of, of sections of the normal bundle as giving uh, deformations uh, of, of the subvariety inside of the ambient variety. And uh, so that kind of makes sense here because uh, sections of OXD are just uh, polynomials of degree D. And uh, those, of course, could correspond to deformations of X, right? You, you just uh, 
add a small multiple of a, of a different polynomial dex, and that would sort of uh, deform it. Okay, so you can think about it like that. Now let's look at the canonical bundle of x. So uh, let's uh, go back to, to our sequence here. So the, the canonical bundle of x uh, will be uh, isomorphic to, well, um, so canonical bundle times uh, wedge 1 of uh, O uh, minus D will be isomorphic to um, the canonical bundle on Pn. Uh, restricted dex. Okay, uh, by, by that same uh, lemma that we had about uh, top exterior powers. All right, and so uh, if we solve this out, you'll see that um, uh, omega x will just be uh, O, all right, O x of d minus n minus 1. All right, so remember, uh, O minus d, you can tensor by O of d, and those will cancel out and you'll get the O of a positive E on the other side right here. So uh, omega X so will be equal to this. And okay, so we have a nice computation of the canonical bundle of uh, hypersurface in projective space. All right, so now let's look at a couple examples. So for, um, for P1, we have, a, we have the, the canonical bundle canonical line bundle of P1 is isomorphic to uh, O of minus 2. Remember the formula was uh, minus n minus 1. So there you go. Uh, but the other thing to observe is that this is actually also equal to uh, the cotangent bundle. Uh, why is that? Because I remember that um, the canonical line bundle is uh, the wedge power equal to the dimension of uh, the canonical bundle. Or sorry, the conomal cotangent bundle. Um, okay, but wedge one does nothing. All right, so so this so this uh, the cotangent bundle is also isomorphic to op one of minus two. Okay, and that tells us now that the, the tangent bundle of p one will be isomorphic to uh, op one of two. All right, and. Um, this gives us uh, uh, one interesting fact that, that we sort of already knew from topology. It tells us that uh, every section uh, of the tangent bundle, or I'm now I'm talking about global sections, uh, uh, has, uh, has two zeros. I guess maybe counted with multiplicity. Uh, why is that? Well, because uh, remember the, the, the global section, so if you take uh, OP1 of two, on the whole space, uh, this uh, we said is isomorphic to uh, just uh, the degree two polynomials, right? All right, so th this is the homogeneous degree two polynomials in, in two variables, and um, and so uh, that will have a, exactly uh, two roots uh, counted correctly with multiplicity. Okay, and so and so. Uh, just to relate this to uh, topology, so let's let's recall that p1 over the complex numbers is uh, is homeomorphic to to the two-dimensional sphere, and um, and so this is this is sometimes called the the hairy ball theorem. The hairy ball theorem says that on a sphere. If you had, you know, a, a sphere with hair like a coconut or something, you can't comb all the hairs straight because that sort of corresponds to a vector field um, without having some kind of, uh, you know, spiral or cowlick or something. So here's, here's a picture of a failed attempt. You know, he tried to comb them all straight, but then at the north and south pole, you ended up with something funny. Those would have to correspond to the two zeros we talked about, you know, or you could end up with something like uh, this kid's head. There's a little... A zero in the vector field of his hair right there okay um, you can contrast that to like a, a torus like a donut uh, it's easy to uh, comb all the hair on a hairy donut just uh, you can comb it uh, all the way around like this or you could you could comb it around like this um, if that makes sense 
Uh, and in fact, let's let's talk about how that's related to algebraic geometry too. So let's look uh, at x now being uh, the vanishing locus of uh, a degree three equation. So f is a uh, uh, degree three, and let's and x is a uh, is equal um, and x is uh, contained in in p two. All right, so x is dimension one. So, so once again, uh, the a conormal sheaf will be isomorphic to the canonical bundle, and uh, remember that the canonical bundle will be uh, equal to uh, O D minus uh, minus N minus one. So in that case, that would just be O of zero. All right. So in this case, the um, the cotangent bundle is trivial. It, it's just a it's just the structure sheaf, and and so also the tangent bundle is equal to the structure sheaf. Now, of course, the structure sheaf has uh, plenty of, well, has, a, has global sections, has the constant global sections. Uh, uh, that, that, that doesn't vanish. All right, just the uh, constant sections don't vanish. And so that's, uh, that's exactly sort of uh, what's happening or with the, the vector fields on the torus that we were looking at. Okay, uh, I guess that the one piece we're missing here is uh, that, that we did prove is that um, x is uh, is topologically a torus. All right, so I'm not going to prove that, but um, that's an important fact. Okay, and of course, I, I should have maybe wrote, written down here that x is smooth so that we can talk about the tangent bundle. All right, uh, one more remark uh, that we uh, might like to notice to see uh, why these canonical, canonical bundle stuff can be useful. We could notice that um, x is, uh, is not isomorphic uh, to p1. All right, uh, how do we know that? Well, because uh, the canonical bundle of X has uh, sections, but the canonical bundle of P, uh, P1, remember the canonical bundle of P1 is O minus two. Uh, this one has no, no global sections. But why does this have no sections? Or well, because there's no uh, degree negative two function that doesn't have poles on, on somewhere on P1, right? Okay. so. Um, so it has no sections, whereas this one, uh, the canonical bundle, uh, is uh, is the structure sheet, so it has sections, has the constant sections. Okay, and then and the canonical bundle is an invariant of isomorphism, meaning that if two schemes or two varieties were isomorphic, uh, their canonical bundles would uh, also be isomorphic and have have the same. Uh, their, their spaces of sections would have the same dimension, for example. In this case, they're not. All right, so this is a, a sort of a way you can see whether when that sometimes will allow you to tell two varieties apart by looking at the canonical bundle. And in fact, that's an important tool when you start trying to classify varieties is you start counting dimensions of sections of the canonical bundle and its powers. Uh, and then you get things like a Kodaira dimension and things like this. Okay, so I think that's all for uh, this chapter on differentials. Um, hopefully I'll maybe do one or two more lectures to say a bit about cohomology. Cohomology will allow us to uh, get information about uh, spaces of sections of these bundles uh, if you, if, from the exact sequences. So, um, so this is just your little preview. If you have an exact sequence, uh, for example, this uh, uh, normal exact sequence uh, in the middle of the screen here, um, you might, for example, uh, be interested to know, you know, how many global sections does the tangent, bun tangent bundle of X have? Um, well, um, you know, you can't really tell from here, uh, but, you, you know, you, if, if you know how many global sections the other two um, things have, you might be able to deduce the third one. Uh, and cohomology will be a very powerful tool that will, will help us with that. So uh, that will be in the next chapter.